Hello, everyone. The uh, Senate Capital Investment Committee will come to order. We have a couple stragglers, but I think we're going to get started. Um, I'd like to start, uh, first of all, with um, introductions, as we do usually with our first committee meetings. Um, just your name and your district, and if you're staff, what your role is on the staff. And why don't I'm Senator Sandy Pappas. I'll be chairing the committee, and I represent St. Paul, and you are now in my district right now. You'll hear me say that every time. Welcome. And why don't we then go to you, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator John Zinski, uh, District 19, which is Faribault and Otana and Wasika, basically straight south on 35, about 40 minutes from the metro. Uh, been on the bonding committee for six years. It is the best committee in the Senate, I will tell you that, and probably in the whole legislature to serve on. I really enjoy the uh, camaraderie we get across the aisle on the buses and the time we spend together, uh, both in, in metro and the rural areas of Minnesota. So happy to be on the committee again and look forward to working with everybody uh, to get a great bonding bill across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Very happy to have you back also on the bonding committee. And um, our newbie, Senator Pa. Thank you, Chair Pappas. Is my mic on? Does it say on? <laughs> okay. Uh, Senator Susan Pa, uh, Senate District 38, uh, representing Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, and Osseo. And I'm super excited to be on this committee. Uh, and I will. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to working with everyone to do many projects across the state. And why don't we go ahead, Ms. Grunwald. Ms. Grunwald. Uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Hannah Grunwald Nolner. Uh, for the purposes of this committee, you can just refer to me as Ms. Nolner. Keep it simple. Nolner, okay. Yes, I am the fiscal staff for um, capital investment from Senate Council. And so I'm here for any questions you might have on the budget side of things. And um, yeah, just here for as a resource. Madam Chair, Stephanie James, Senate Council. Um, I've served the, this committee since 2011. Um, looking forward to another year with you all. Hello, my name is Fatima Costa Mendoza, and I am the committee legislative assistant for Senator Pappas. Hi, I'm Rachel Carlson. I am the committee administrator for capital investment, and prior to this, I was Senator Pappas's legislative assistant for two years. Senator Nelson. Hello, I'm Carla Nelson. I'm in my fifth term in the Senate. Glad to be back on the Capital Investment Committee with you, Madam Chair. We've shared many of these committees together. And uh, I live in Rochester, represent parts of Olmstead County, and all of Dodge County. Senator Friends. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Nick Frentz, and I represent District 18, which is uh, all of Nicollet County and parts of Blue Earth and Lesseur County, and live in North Mankato, and very excited to join the Capital Investment Committee for the first time. Thank you. We're very excited to have you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Eric Pratt, I represent, um, excuse me, Senate District 54, which is most of Scott County. Uh, I spent my, I, this is my second time on the committee. I got a chance to do it last biennium, and I agree with uh, Senator Jasinski. It's a great committee to get out and tour the state and see, uh, uh, see a lot of great projects and, and build some uh, camaraderie on the, uh, on the committee as well. Senator Zhang. Hi, um, I'm Senator Tu Zhang, Senate District 44, uh, Maplewood, Oakdale, the first tier suburbs there, Little Canada, Landfall, and Pine Springs. And uh, I'm very excited to be on this committee. And Thank welcome. You. And you were on the committee in the House. No. No, you were First not. First time ever. Oh, okay. Great. All right. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jordan Rasmussen. I represent five counties in West Central Minnesota. I live in Fergus Falls. And it's my first time on the Senate Capital Investment Committee, but um, also served on it uh, in the House. So You were the one who served in the House. Yes. Glad okay. to be here. Great. And let's go back to Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Madam Chair. Zainab Mohammed, I represent South Minneapolis, District 63. Great, and we have some more staff people in the back if you want to come forward, all of you, and introduce yourselves so that the people in the audience can see you and tell us what your role is. Thank you very much. I'm Nate Pasco, the Senate DFL Researcher for Capital Investment. I'm Irene. I am Senator Paz, LA. My name is Irene. 
name's Andrew George. I'm a committee page for capital investment. My name is Sam. I'm a committee page for capital investment. Uh, my name is Ryan Russell. I'm the legislative assistant for Senator Zhang. All right. Is that everyone? Oh, one more. Oh, no. One more. One more. Sure. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Larissa Fisher, Republican Research. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, okay. So we have the agenda before us. So let's move right on to our third item on the agenda, Senate Council Committee Jurisdiction Overview. Ms. James. While they're coming up to the desk, I just wanted to make a comment that I know this committee goes until 5 o'clock. That's really, really late. But I wanted you all to know that the first committee I ever chaired, which was the Property Tax Division, met from 4 to 6 p.m. So we've shortened our day a little bit. Ms. James and Ms. Nelder. Madam Chair and members, I will do a very uh, high level uh, description of what bonding is and what your tasks will be and, and what bonding bills uh, need to get written. Um, and then Ms. Uh, Nelner will uh, describe um, certain aspects of the financial aspects of bonding that you need to know. And then um, the folks from um, um, MMB will fill in a lot, of, a lot more details. I'm going to start at the very beginning. What is a bond? What does it mean to bond? What is bonding? It is the way that the state borrows money from investors and then promises to pay it back over time in installments with interest. Um, the, the primary mechanism that we use, the, the type of bond that this committee will um, work with the most is general obligation bonds. General ob obligation bonds are special because they are backed by the full faith and credit of the state as provided under our Constitution. And what that means is that if the state doesn't have enough money in the general fund to pay, make payments on the bonds, the state is obligated to tax for it. And it is that implicit uh, possibility of taxation that makes the bonding bill a bill that raises revenue, and therefore it has to originate in the House. Um, we can only use general obligation bonds to pay for projects that have a public purpose, and that's actually a requirement for all state money. Um, the, the purpose for the bonds has to be specified in law, and this requirement that's in the Constitution um, means that in the appropriation language that we use for the projects, we have to be a little bit more explicit than you might have to be for an appropriation of general fund money. And then we can only use general obligation bonds for one of the many purposes listed in the Constitution. And this is the list that's copied from the Constitution. Um, all, all, all allowed uses of public debt. And the one that is of most interest to this committee is the first one, which is to acquire and to better public land and buildings and other public improvements of a capital nature. Um, what this means in greater detail is that the project has to be a capital project. It has to be something that is fixed, so not a car, and it has to be long-lived with a life of more than 10 years. It also has to be sort of a substantial improvement and not merely basic maintenance. A bill that, that um, provides GO bonds for these kinds of purposes requires a three-fifths vote in both the House and the Senate, so 41 votes in the Senate and 81 votes in the House. Um, there are two processes that it's useful for your local governments to be aware of when they're coming to the legislature to ask for um, bond proceeds. One is to use the MMB capital budget process. There's an online submission and and our folks from MMB will talk about that quite a bit more. Um, there's also a legislative process um, that they should also do in addition to the MMB process, which is to have you all author bills for them. 
um, and then possibly the committee will hear them in committee or tour them or, or both. This is a list of some information that's useful for, for those of us who draft bonding bills for you for individual projects. We need to know who owns and will own the land and building and facility. And this is because the project has to be publicly owned. It has to be owned by either a state or local government. Um, we also need to know how, how much the local government is requesting for their project. And, and then will that amount pay for the whole project or will they be coming with a local match? Um, the project, um, and then we need to describe exactly what the, pro what the money will be used for. There's lots of phases in a construction uh, timeline and we wanna know which ones of those, the money that they're asking for will be needed for. Are they going to be acquiring land? Will they use the money for pre-design, design, construction, furnishing and equipping, demo demolition? Renovation, is it, um, are they renovating an existing space? Or are they expanding? Those are all details that we need to know when we draft a bonding bill for you. And we need to know the location, what city or county the project is in, and then how will the facility be used? And we need to know if there will be a significant amount of private use, what entities will be using the facility, and, and how is, there, is the facility gonna generate any revenue? things of that nature. It's also useful for me to have a contact person for the project so that I can contact them with additional questions. I've included a couple tips at the bottom there. Um, it's, in, it's useful for your local governments to fill out the MMB worksheet, even if they've missed the window for submissions to MMB. Um, and then from the get-go, encourage your local governments to go through the proper full procedure for submitting requests through MMB in the odd years. That information is useful to MMB for deciding how to construct the governor's capital budget, but it's also useful to us and to all, to all of us as we're putting together an omnibus bill. Um, there are a couple independent but kind of overlapping funding requirements for capital um, investment bills. One is that the project has to be fully funded. MMB will not release funds if a project is not fully funded. Um, and that means, well, MMB will go into greater detail about what they mean by that. Um, and ha they, you have to have all of the money committed before they will release any of the money. Also, we have a statutory um, requirement for a 50% match of non-state money. Um, it's just a statutory requirement and can and often is waived. Um, I just talked about those things. Um, if a project is not a candidate for general obligation bond proceeds, there are other mechanisms that this committee uses on a fairly regular basis to fund projects. The first one listed here is appropriation bonds that are issued by the state. And you have in your packets a very detailed memo about uh, appropriation bonds um, in the state and the history of our use of them. Um, they can be used for projects that are owned by private entities, um, unlike geo bonds, and they can be used for things that aren't necessarily capital expenses, so they're more flexible in that way too than general obligation bonds. Excuse me, um, Ms. James, are those mostly just housing appropriation bonds or there's a variety? What are some of the others? Or can um, you invent some? Madam Chair and members, yes, you, you can and probably will invent some new uses for them this year. Um, uh, the, we've used them for the Viking Stadium and for Lewis and Clark projects, the water projects in the Southwest, and for um, what else? Um, I've got them listed in the memo. Um, the public infrastructure projects in the city of Duluth that is sort of like the... Um, Destination Medical Center um, arrangement. Um, electric vehicle infrastructure, um, equipment grants to public television stations, remedial um, cleanup of contaminated sites, um, and also, oh, those are the main ones. Uh, we, in the early years, there was a pay, perf pay for performance program, but those bonds were not issued. And then also we used them temporarily, well, no, we used them to refund tobacco settlement revenue bonds to close a budget gap. So okay. they've been used for a lot of purposes and certainly there will be more uses of them in the future, if not this year sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
And then revenue bonds is another possibility. Revenue bonds are backed by, uh, oh, one, one more point about appropriation bonds. They're not backed by the full faith and credit of the state. They're, and they're not backed by a revenue stream. They are merely, the promise to the investors is simply that if the legislature appropriates money to pay these back, that money will be applied to, to paying you. And so because that is more risky than what we have, the promise that we make for geo bonds, they will sell for at a higher interest rate. They're more expensive, more expensive way for the state to finance things. Um, revenue bonds are another instrument, and these are backed by a dedicated revenue stream or a specified revenue stream. Um, depending on the reliability of that revenue stream, um, they can be um, cheaper than appropriation bonds. Um, and the 2011 tobacco settlement revenue bonds are an example of that, where we had money coming in from the settlement of a lawsuit, and that um, expected revenue stream was used to um, back revenue bonds. Trunk highway bonds is another instrument that this committee has used many times. Um, trunk highway bonds have to be used for trunk highway purposes. Um, oftentimes, trunk highway projects are a combination of trunk highway purpose and not trunk highway purpose. So we often will see a blend of trunk highway bond proceeds plus some geo bond proceeds or cash or something um, to pay for, let's say, access roads that are, um, that are not part of the trunk highway. We've also had agency-issued appropriation bonds, and these are what you were describing, uh, Madam Chair, the housing infrastructure bonds. They're issued by the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Um, and they are, we, we pay them through a statutory appropriation to make the payments on them. I'm happy to answer any questions at this point, if you have any here. Any questions so far? Okay, proceed. Thank you. There we go. Again, uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Hannah Grunewald Noldner, and I'm the fiscal analyst on this committee um, with Senate Council of Research and Fiscal Analysis. I'll just do a brief uh, overview of some capital investment budget areas that um, figures that you'll see in budget documents from MMB give you a little bit of historical data um, and keep it brief, and I'll um, uh, defer to MMB on a lot more of the detail. But to begin, uh, I'll just do a brief overview. Since 1983, the legislature has passed bonding bills or, or bonding bills, bonding type bills in all every year except for four years, um, 2004, 2016, 2021, and 2022. Historically, as you may know, uh, bonding bills follow a pattern of larger bonding bills in even-numbered years and smaller bonding bills in odd-numbered years, although in recent years that has kind of shifted and um, not necessarily been a pattern anymore. Uh, additionally, MMB is authorized to sell state bonds and manage debt, and the largest share of state debt consists of general obligation bonds, um, as Ms. James mentioned, whose debt service is paid from the general fund, and debt service being uh, both the interest payments and repayment of principal on those bonds. So this slide will show um, the total outstanding tax-supported debt in the state. Uh, the graph is split between uh, general obligation bonds and all other debt. The general obligation bond portion also includes various purpose bonds and trunk highway bonds. And as you'll see, the most recent data is from November, the November forecast in 2022. And uh, as of that time, there was 6.4 billion in current outstanding principal for general obligation bonds and about 1.6 billion in outstanding principal for all other tax supported obligations. Uh, totaling in just under eight billion in total outstanding tax supported debt for the state. So this next slide just shows that same information, just in a little bit more readable of a format. Um, more for your purposes as you go through uh, the session, if you need a quick uh, resource. So I won't go into too much detail here. So moving to debt service payments. Uh, again, this is uh, the interest payments and repayment of principal on state bonds. As you'll see, this 
table breaks down um, kind of a historical perspective over the past about 10 years, uh, and it breaks down the GO bonds, trunk highway bonds, other debt, and all, all total debt service paid. And as you'll see, the GO bonds uh, throughout the past 10 years have definitely been the largest of out, of, out of all the debt state, state debt. And you'll also notice um, on total debt service, uh, most of the time over the past 10 years, it's been under 1 billion, but projected to be to reach 1 billion in fiscal year 2024 and beyond. This next slide again is showing the same data from the previous slide, although this starts in fiscal year 2006, just to show a little bit more historical perspective on debt service costs. And you'll notice uh, there's a dip in the, in the graph there. And uh, I believe this is due to the tobacco bonds being refinanced um, and a lot of bonds being paid off at the time. And this last slide is just showing an overview, um, kind of a big picture of how debt service and capital projects fit into the state budget. Uh, the total general fund spending for fiscal year 24-25 53.95 billion, and debt service makes up 2% of that, and capital projects and grants makes up 1% of that. Capital projects and grants are made up of those appropriation bonds and agency bonds that uh, Ms. James covered. And that concludes my presentation. I'll stand for any questions, um, and happy to answer any questions in committee or after committee. Um, I see that uh, Senator Dibble has joined us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies for being tardy. I had a really good reason, which I'll tell you about later, and you will approve of my tardiness. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I am State Senator uh, Scott Dibble, and I've been in the Senate since 2002, served one term prior to that in the other body. And um, I've never been on the bonding committee. Um, oh, I represent a part of South Minneapolis, or Southwest Minneapolis, downtown, and a little bit of north. Um, I've been on other kinds of capital-oriented enterprises like LCCMR and Lassard Sam's, but I've never been on the bonding committee, so I'm really, really pleased to be here. Thank you very much. And it's great. And it's great to have you. Thanks so much. And thank you, uh, Ms. Nolder. Thank you very much for, to you and Ms. James. That was, that was very short and sweet and very clear. And, and we have the paperwork to read over afterwards. Um, next on our agenda is this uh, Marianne Conboy from MMB. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Marianne Conboy, and I'm the Capital Budget Coordinator at Minnesota Management and Budget. And with me today is Jennifer Hassemer, the Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management at MMB. I will be providing an overview of the capital budget process for state agencies and political subdivisions for projects that are submitting through MMB. And then Assistant Commissioner Hassemer will provide an overview of additional bonding restrictions, debt capacity, and the cancellation report. Generally speaking, the capital budget process runs on the same schedule for both state agencies and political subdivisions. And in this presentation, I'll focus on how it relates to political subdivisions, such as cities, towns, and counties. And I'll use the terms political subdivision and local government interchangeably. MMB's capital budget process follows a timeline established in Minnesota Statutes Chapter 16A.11, and capital budget requests are developed in odd numbered years on, and the final requests and the governor's recommendations are published in January of even numbered calendar years. Although local government projects can be introduced to a bonding bill directly through state legislators, um, just like Ms. James mentioned before, we encourage local governments to submit their projects to, through MMB for two reasons. It provides a pathway for MMB to review the project on the front end and also it provides the legislature uh, publication of the projects under consideration by the governor and the legislature. Historically, the capital budget has been funded primarily by issuing state geo bonds, which may only be used for qualified expenditures. I want to provide a quick highlight of the capital budget system, or CBS. MMB publishes preliminary requests, final requests, and the governor's recommendations 
using information published in the state's capital budget system. Um, the project requests are submitted by state agency and local government staff or officials with adequate information to provide statutorily required details and also to provide for meaningful consideration of the project by the governor and the legislature. MMB's capital budget system website includes information about how to access the system, including a user guide and training videos. And in addition, MMB hosts Q&A sessions um, and presentations when the system is open and receiving requests. CBS opens at the same time as instructions are posted in May of odd numbered years. So like around the same time that session is ending. MMB collects this capital budget information following the statutorily directed process, which is open to state agencies and political subdivisions whose capital projects are generally eligible for GEO bonds. MMB's capital budget instructions website includes a memo, an instruction document, templates, um, frequently asked questions. Those are all honestly great resources um, to review just to get um, a sense of you know, what we're looking for. I'll note that we've seen more interest in recent years for nonprofit projects, which are outside the scope of geo bonds in the statutory process, but to assist in a similar way, MMB has created a form to collect information about these projects. Project information is collected by MMB and then submitted to the legislature and posted on MMB's website in three reports, which together can be referred to as the capital budget books. First is a project summary that acts as a sort of a cover sheet. Projects are listed under each agency or local unit of government in priority order um, with funding requests um, and anticipated future needs for the project. Second is the project narrative, which includes an at-a-glance summary and detailed descriptions of the project scope and timeline. And then third, there's a project detail report for each request that includes all the funding sources and all the costs for the project. Um, here's an example of a published local uh, request just to, to provide a sense of what this looks like. Um, and looking at the project cost table on the right, I should note that many projects have updated cost estimates now in the 2023 legislative session compared to this published information that was in advance of the 2022 session due to increased construction costs and other updates that may have occurred. I mean, Ms. Convoy, has those updated um, numbers, have those been posted or is MMB still working on those? Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, um, the process um, that MMB has, um, it doesn't update the project costs outside the scope of the governor's recommendations, um, but MMB will be working with the, the committees to provide updated inflationary, um, an updated inflation schedule so that for projects that used the inflation schedule in 2022, which is now very much outdated, um, they'll be able to get an updated cost for what the new world of inflation looks like, for example. So um, you might say like 20% or something inflation cost, just kind of a round number like that, or will it be more precise? It will be more precise, Madam Chair. Um, so we, inflation, inflationary adjustments that use MMB's um, schedule for inflation are based on the midpoint of construction, which is the point in time in between of when construction forces arrive on the site to when the pro to when the project can be used for its intended purpose. And so the, it actually gets pretty specific based on the midpoint of construction. So um, a project might have a new midpoint of construction, so we'll have to do um, a lot of individual work with projects to make sure that we have those dates right so that we can cost them out correctly. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, this is the upcoming timeline for state agencies, which is very similar to that of local governments. Um, on a high level, um, MMB authorizes CBS users from March until about May, um, and then May is when the instructions are posted and CBS is open. And then after that, projects are due mid-June for preliminary submissions. And then July 15th is the big day when the preliminary requests are published for the legislature um, to see. Uh, then by mid-October, we require that requests are finalized in, in the cost and their scope. And then we prepare materials for the governor's decision-making process. 
January 15th is when all the final requests are published alongside the governor's recommendations in the legislature, to the legislature. And then um, that's a very high level calendar um, for the process leading up to the next even numbered bonding year, which starts in just a few months, which. So considering we didn't do a bill in 21 or 22, um, is MMB have, are you going to be making different recommendations or like I mentioned earlier, just kind of updated numbers on the governor's bill, last year's bill? Madam Chair, um, so for this um, being like not the typical bonding year, um, MMB works with the governor's office in um, developing the governor's recommendations, which includes some projects, um, uh, which includes projects that may be included in 2022 that have updated costs for 2023. Um, but I might, not, I, might not, I might not be answering your question. I'm sorry. Um, actually, I did want to say something about um, what you said about the typical bonding year. Um, considering we have $6 billion, $6 billion worth of back projects um, and that we have traditionally done bonding almost every year, except those years that um, Ms. James or Ms. Um, Nadler mentioned. Nadner? Neldner? Noldner. Noldner. Just give me time, Noldner. Um, I'd like just like to get away from that typical bonding year. And, and I would like MMB to, and I'll mention this to the commissioner if I haven't already, that I know it creates more work for you, but we really need to have an every year um, process because um, it's my intention that we're going to come in every year and do a bonding bill, um, at least till we get caught up and maybe beyond that. I mean, typically, maybe in the, um, the odd year, what are we going, we're in the odd year now, the even year we do a larger bonding bill and then we do a smaller bonding bill. There was always, almost always a bonding bill every year. So let's not talk about bonding years anymore. That's every year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so MMB um, takes all the submitted information um, and evaluates it and asks questions to projects and conducts site visits. And I just wanted to give a sense of um, what MMB looks for in their evaluation of projects. And this is not an exhaustive list, um, but it, I think it's helpful to see, you know, what kind of analysis are we doing at MMB. Um, first and foremost, we look to ensure that the project is eligible for the requested funding source, which is most commonly geo bonds. We review projects to understand what the problem that's being solved is by the project, if the project serves a statewide or regionally significant purpose, and if the project can be completed in phases. We also review to determine if the project has the required 50% non-state match. Um, we look to see if a project can be served by an existing grant program at a state agency, if there might be a request coming down the line for additional state operating subsidies um, to maintain something, and again, making sure that the project serves a public purpose and if local government's leadership shows support of the project with a local resolution of support. As mentioned before, when a project is submitted through MMB's process, a key evaluation that we make is to ensure that the project described is eligible for the requested funding. Um, and when the projects are submitted, MMB can identify if a project or part of a project should actually tie to a different funding source. Um, another question that I wanted to highlight um, that we've received in the past from local governments um, who may want to receive a grant or loan made from state geo bond proceeds, um, who want to be reimbursed from the geo bond proceeds for expenses that were incurred in the past and for which they have already paid their contractor from, for, from other funds. Minnesota's general obligation bonds are tax exempt. Federal law regulates the issuance and the use of tax exempt bonds which means that any expenses incurred by a political subdivision for a project prior to the effective date of the bonding bill must remain funded by sources other than geo bond proceeds, such as local funds. Um, but uh, I'll note that non-state expenditures such as these can count towards matching funds and or the full funding requirement for the project. Um, but those are just two separate questions. 
So let me just clarify. Um, uh, for example, if an entity kind of took out a loan to jumpstart their project, could bonding dollars be used to pay back that loan? Uh, Madam Chair, it would depend um, on the timing. So if the loan was used for real expenditures, then, and the, and the state funding source was geo bonds, then no. Okay, thank is that, you. Is that right? <laughs> the, other, um, the other question that I wanted to highlight uh, pertains to nonprofit projects. In general, there are two pathways for projects that serve nonprofits to be included in the capital budget. Which path depends on the ownership of the project? If the project is owned by a local unit of government, then geo bonds might work. But if the project is owned by a nonprofit, then it would need to be funded with cash and it could be granted directly to the nonprofit. So the important point here is that a political subdivision cannot be a mere fiscal agent or conduit through which geo bonds flow. Uh, nonprofits can work with a political subdivision um, to request geo bond funds for a project that has a public purpose and subsequently the political subdivision can enter into a use agreement with the nonprofit um, permitting um, the outside group to carry on that governmental program. But the political subdivision must have a qualifying ownership interest in the project and remain responsible for operating the bond finance property and the public program associated with it, even if the outside group abandons the project or the property. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Jen Hassemer. And welcome, Deputy Commissioner Hasamar. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to members of the committee. For the record, I'm Jennifer Hasamar, Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management at uh, Minnesota Management and Budget. So I will be covering a few of the agenda items that you have listed here today. And with the Chair's permission, what I'd like to do is cover some of the additional bonding restrictions first um, to amplify some of the information that Ms. James and Ms. Comboy have already provided, um, pause for some questions before then moving on to the debt capacity and capital investment guidelines um, to finish off the conversation with you today. Um, we'll try to get the technology working smoothly up here. <laughs> um, the first slide I wanted to cover with you is uh, to emphasize a point that Ms. Conboy just made is that the state does issue tax exempt debt um, for the vast majority of the projects funded through a bonding bill. The trade-off is that the state gets to realize lower borrowing costs in, in exchange for having the tax exempt debt, um, but the federal, federal government imposes a host of uh, regulations and restrictions that then apply to the debt and that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to as well. One of the primary constraints with issuing tax exempt debt is that the debt must be for a governmental purpose. There can't be primarily a private activity associated with the project. I will get a little bit more into private use in a few slides from here. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out is that the state is required to develop, deliver a legal opinion to bondholders at the time that we sell the bonds. Um, so we work with outside bond counsel that are appointed by the attorney general's office um, to deliver an opinion at the time that we sell the bonds that, that indicate the bonds are validly issued um, and have met all state um, and federal tax requirements. Um, we will not be able to sell the bonds without those legal opinions. And the last thing that MMB wants to encounter um, when we go to issue the bonds is that we can't actually raise the funds for the projects that have been authorized by the legislature. Uh, so during the course of a capital budget development, we do work very closely with our bond council in reviewing the projects that are being considered um, by the legislature to make sure that we can identify any red flags that could potentially um, prohibit the funding of those projects. Um, on this next slide here, um, this is some information that Ms. James already walked through, but I'll just highlight it again briefly for you. Um, other than trunk highway bonds, the vast majority of the general obligation debt that the legislature authorized is authorized under the provision on the screen here um, that the, the projects are for um, acquisition and betterment of public lands and buildings um, of a capital nature. Um, 
As we've heard already, uh, the, the bonding appropriations must clearly specify what the project is and the full scope of what is being financed. Um, I want to spend a couple more slides going, diving a little bit deeper into capital expenditures so you have a sense of what would be an eligible capital expenditure and what would be some items of ineligible capital expenditures that we try to flag uh, during our review of projects. So first, um, the, as you just heard, the Constitution talks about improvements and betterments. It's not exactly clear what that exactly means. Um, so, over, so over the last few decades, MMB has worked closely with Bond Council to come up with a fair amount of guidance and guidelines about what would constitute an eligible capital expenditure under the Constitution. Um, first of all, uh, the expenditure must relate to a fixed asset. So we're looking at land, buildings, improvements to land and buildings, including capital equipment installed in the buildings, um, but would not include standalone capital equipment that could be easily removed. Uh, the asset must have a, a useful life of at least 10 years to be eligible for geo bonds. Um, if, if we're looking at improvements to an existing asset, a building that's already been built, um, it must be a substantial improvement to that existing asset, not something that's um, repairing a couple roof shingles on the top of the building, but for example, tearing off the roof and doing a complete reconstruction, adding an addition to the building, or renovating an existing building down to the studs and reconfiguring the interior space. Um, of course, acquisitions are eligible directly explicitly under the Constitution, so that would be outright ownership, um, acquisition of easements, rights of way, um, and other buildings. Pre-design and design has been deemed an eligible expenditure um, because the, the construction project is presumed to follow, um, but the, the, the pre-design and design must be for a specific project. It's something that is known and not something that's still being um, sort of scoped out and um, um, generalized. Under the category of construction costs, that can include everything from demolition of existing structures on the property that need to be cleared before the new construction can take place, hazardous material abatement, um, other infrastructure needed to, to run into the new facility, um, and other site, prepar site preparation. Um, and as I mentioned, some of the, the major renovation projects we look at closely to make sure that it, it does fall into the eligible capital expenditure category. You might hear the term uh, fixtures, furnitures, and equipment, sometimes abbreviated to FF and E. Um, that is an eligible capital expenditure when it's done in combination with a new construction or a major renovation of an existing building um, and would be whatever is needed to make that building function as intended by the legislature. So to give a few examples of what would be an ineligible capital expenditure, um, I have two slides to just briefly walk you through. This includes options to purchase land and buildings. Um, any FF&E uh, uh, projects that are um, outside of a new construction or a major renovation. For projects that are not yet cited, um, anything from general studies to evaluate the need for the project or promotional materials, lobbying materials, educational materials, um, those would not be eligible capital expenditures. Any type of master planning or computer or financial modeling would also be an ineligible expenditure. Um, one more slide of ineligible capital expenditures. Demolition when there's not a planned redevelopment of the site because there's no capital asset that you're left with or that results from there. Um, all moving and relocation costs are deemed ineligible. Operating and maintenance costs betterments to leaseholds that have less than a 10-year term. Um, and then software, data management systems, personal computers are all ineligible expenditures. So, and Just hold on. Okay. Senator Nelson. Yes, uh, could I ask a question? Yes, yes. Um, my, uh, can you just uh, back up for a minute and tell me about betterments to leaseholds with less than a 10-year term? What if there are betterments to leaseholds with a term longer than 10 years? Commissioner Hesmer. 
Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, that's an excellent question. Um, we don't typically see those types of projects because of the constitutional requirement that GO bond funded projects must be publicly owned by a political subdivision. Um, so usually we see the outright fee ownership or a really long ground lease interest. Um, so I, in my term at the state, actually have not seen that question. So that is a, a good, um, hopefully hypothetical question about betterments to leaseholds um, for a greater than 10, but less than, let's say, 20 to 25 year term. One follow-up, please. Yeah, Senator Nelson. Yes, and, and to your uh, response, is that just for geo bonds, or what about there's other there's appropriation bonds, there's cash. Does this prohibition on uh, betterments to leaseholds um, apply to those other types of bonds, or is it just to the geo bonds? Commissioner Hassamar. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, this is um, mostly a geo bonding restriction because of the constitutional public ownership requirement. There is some greater flexibility um, for some of the other financing sources, um, but one of the underpinnings, a lot of these um, principles and guidance come from accounting principles in terms of what is a capitalizable expense. So there is a little bit of generality um, across the different funding sources that we would wanna take a look at. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Why don't you proceed? Thank you, Madam Chair. So shifting a little bit to the use of bond finance property, this is something that um, both state law and federal tax law um, cause us to pay some attention to. And I'll, I'll start with the state law restrictions on the use of bond finance property. Um, as we've been talking about, uh, geo bond funded projects must be publicly owned, but that doesn't mean you can't contract, the project sponsors can't contract with a third party to come in and operate the project. Um, state statute governs the types of um, management agreements, lease agreements, um, operating agreements that those political subdivisions can enter into on bond finance property. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of the highlights of what some of those restrictions are. Um, it's all found, it all stems from Minnesota statute section 16A.695. Um, and all of these use agreements do get routed through MMB for, for MMB's formal approval before they can be executed. One of the primary takeaways is that any use agreement under state law needs to be in furtherance of the governmental program that was intended at the property. Uh, the term of any of those use agreements is, is limited to a, a shorter term than the useful life of the property. Um, a general rule of thumb that um, MMB will give its approval to is 50% of the useful life of the financed asset. And then we also look very carefully at some of the revenue arrangements under those use agreements. Um, for, some, for some reasons I'll get into in the next couple slides dealing with private use. Um, but under state statute, it's important to know that the political subdivision is allowed to retain revenues from their property up to a certain amount. But if they exceed certain thresholds specified in statute, um, then some of those revenues need to be shared with the state. But turning... So Commissioner Hassamar, that would be the case if a city had a building and they decided, and it was financed with state bonds, and they decided they wanted to rent out a portion of the building to, to someone in the private sector to run a bookstore or something. Is, is that what we're talking about here, or do I have it wrong? Madam Chair, that's exactly one example that could be what we're talking mm -hmm. about here. Um, and to get MMB's approval under the statute, that bookstore, as an example, would need to be in furtherance of what the overall purpose of the building was. Right. So it would be like history books about the state of Minnesota. Right. Right. <laughs> what about a coffee shop? <laughs> <laughs> We do get those questions, Madam Chair, and those are the things that we do look at very carefully yeah. to make sure we're not running afoul of either state law or federal tax law. Okay, thank you. So that's a great segue into this next slide, which is the federal tax law um, view on these use agreements. And they have this concept of private use. And uh, federal tax law severely limits the amount of private use that can be attributable uh, to tax-exempt bond-financed property. Um, the IRS defines private use as any direct or indirect use by a non-governmental person or entity. And that can take many different forms from straight ownership to leases and subleases, management contracts, output contracts, and general catch-all categories of special legal entitlements or special economic benefits. 
federal tax law, because the state is such a large issuer of debt, when we sell bonds, we're regularly raising hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. Um, federal tax law limits the amount of private use that can be attributed to any of our bond issues to just $15 million. So it's a very small fraction of the overall bonding portfolio that the state manages. And for that reason, as a matter of policy, MMB does not uh, knowingly approve um, instances of private use so that we can preserve that small $15 million limit um, for any unknown or unanticipated um, developments that occur. There are some safe, safe harbors that exist under federal tax law, so we always encourage folks to come and talk to MMB at the earliest opportunity so that we can work through those situations and help provide some guidance about how to potentially structure the project differently. Um, the one consequence that if we were to violate that $15 million threshold of private use attributable to any of our bond issues is that the entire bond issue and not just the portion that's attributable to the project giving rise to the private use, the entire issue could be deemed taxable debt um, with resulting financial penalties that the state might need to owe to the federal government. Um, so that gives a, a strong motiv motivating factor for why we pay attention to this. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm thinking about airports and the many airports that we have, the gate usage, the concession or the food and all. So do all of those count? I mean, 15 million is not a lot for all of the private use in something like our airports. Deputy Commissioner. I just wonder if you can comment on that. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, that's actually a great segue. I'm going to flip to the next slide really quick. You can get a, a sneak peek at some of the categories of projects that might give rise to private use, and airports are exactly one of the types of projects where that might happen. Um, so we do take a look at those types of agreements, but that's exactly what we're talking about, Senator Nelson. Um, so you can see on the slide here and on the list um, other types of um, facilities that might generate um, some type of, um, pri you know, allow a private party to come in and use part of the facility. Could be sports centers, convention centers, um, office buildings, parking garages, uh, stadiums, business incubators, even cell phone towers, and sometimes the way solar panels and electric vehicle charging stations are installed involves um, giving a third party um, rights and access to bond finance property. So those are just some examples. So you have that in the back of your mind as you're looking at some um, at projects this year. Some other um, restrictions or conditions to uh, that. I'm apply. sorry, could we just stop for a minute because I'm, I'm confused. So in, in, one, in one slide, you said that if the private use was less than 50% of, I assume, the value of the property, that that could be allowable. But then you said something about no more than $15 million because of IRS rules. And then Senator Nelson brought up the situation with airport terminals, so which have a lot of private use in them. So are you telling me that you know, state bonds could be used for you know, a public, the public portion of that project, but, but have to be careful it's not used for the private portion? Or could you just clarify that again, please? Sure, Madam Chair. I, I know it's a lot of information we're throwing at you here today. Um, first of all, on the 50% limitation, that had to do with the term of the agreement that a third party um, could enter into on state bond finance property. Um, so if, for example, a building had a 20-year useful life, if the political subdivision, if the owner of that building wanted to contract with a third party to operate part of it, the maximum term that the use agreement or operating agreement could be approved for would be for 10 years. Um, and they could get renewals, of course, uh, if the political subdivision agrees to that. Um, but that's where the 50% um, limitation came in. So that's, you're talking about there, um, if, uh, um, like we have the Science Museum. They, um, it's owned by the city of St. Paul. They receive state bonds. Uh, but that, they, the Science Museum is basically renting it from the city, but the term can only be 10 years? Madam Chair, that that's, the case? that's correct. Um, but then it could be renewed. Renewed, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So then can you respond again to Senator Nelson's issue about airport terminals and what portion of that would be eligible for state bonds? 
Right, um, Madam Chair, it, it, it's a rubric that we would be looking through. So first we would wanna determine what is the publicly owned portion of a project. If it's the entire terminal, we can look at the entire terminal, but then we'll go down to the next level of analysis and start asking questions about who is using it and what types of um, you know, independent parties might be coming in to enter into a contract to use all or a portion of the terminal. Um, there are ways to structure those contracts where um, MMB does give approval to those quite regularly based on projects that have been funded by the legislature in recent years, but it's something that we do spend a lot of time working directly with the political subdivision and the third parties as they negotiate their contracts. MMB is um, right in the mix helping negotiate those contracts with everyone. So it depends. It depends. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Senator Dibble. Thank you. So uh, it depends on what? Like the amount of space that's allocated for the food concession, um, whether the food concession is consistent with the larger need and purpose of the facility. What, what are those factors upon which it depends? We've, we've funded a lot of uh, sports facilities over the years. So I'm just wondering how we were able to do that. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, um, it depends. The, the it depends is can they meet? We, we use a checklist, and I don't know if that, that came up on one of the prior slides. Um, we have a use agreement checklist that we share with all of the political subdivisions, and that helps walk them through all of the different conditions that they would need to comply with in order to get MMB's approval under the statute to enter into that use agreement. Um, some, of the re, some of the conditions in that checklist are being able to identify um, statutory or legal authority that supports um, the purpose for which they're trying to enter into a, a separate agreement. Um, like I said before, we look very closely at the revenue sharing provisions um, because we're mindful of that $15 million private use limitation. Um, we do engage on revenue sharing um, parts of the conversation with these entities um, and help them structure their debt so that they can enter into the agreement that they're looking in to enter into while we also protect the state's debt. Well, I'd, I'd love to see that list because you know we, we and and that's only because we get a lot of proposers that come into our office they have ideas they want to put a bookstore in there they want to do this that and the other um and it'd be nice to have um for our you know and, and they're looking for advice and how to proceed et cetera, et cetera. and it'd be nice for us as as leaders in our districts to have an informed conversation with those proposers thanks Thank Absolutely. you, Senator Dibble. Yeah. Commissioner. And Madam Chair, we'll be happy to share any of these uh, materials with the committee so everyone can have them as well. So going into the grant agreements, um, this, is a, this is a condition that applies uh, just to local projects. So when state agencies receive funding for their own state agency projects, they do not need to enter into grant agreements to start spending those funds. But for the local projects that receive funding in a bonding bill, they do need to enter into a grant agreement uh, with the responsible state agency um, before they can access any of those funds. MMB has developed grant agreement templates that we've made available on our website, um, and we encourage all of the state agencies to use so that there's consistency across all of these uh, projects that get funding. Um, we have different types of agreement based on the funding source. So we have agreements where, for projects that have been awarded general obligation bond funds, we have agreements for projects that have been awarded general fund cash in a capital project. Um, and all of those agreements also walk through all the various um, statutory requirements that apply to public construction projects in general um, that are out, outside of the strict bonding um, requirements but nonetheless apply to a lot of these projects. It's important to point out that bonding bills and riders for capital improvement projects by themselves do not give these political subdivisions authority to operate their project. Um, political subdivisions do need to have independent statutory authority to operate whatever it is that they're seeking funding for. Um, 
when working with the responsible uh, state agency that is administering the funds, that state agency will be doing a review um, of the, the project and as Ms. Conboy had, had referenced in the, how we look on the front end, whether there's a, a plan to operate the project and to fund it into the future. Um, state agencies will also be undertaking that review post enactment of a bonding bill and before the funds are released um, to make sure that there's a plan to continue operating the project. Um, but as we've already stated, that the local government does not get resolved, absolved of um, any type of oversight over the project, and they, they will remain responsible for actively staying engaged and um, uh, monitoring the, the ongoing operations of the project. Um, Commissioner Hassamar, so I've seen that with um, some of our nonprofit projects that they generally go through deed. Um, but if you have like a, a, a city, I didn't recall that we don't appropriate directly to the city. We still appropriate through a state agency. Madam Chair, that's correct. None of the state appropriations go directly to the political subdivisions. They all flow through a state agency. So could they typically go through, who do they go through? Do they go through MMB or would it be some other state agency? Madam Chair, it's typically a number of different state agencies that get awarded the funds from mm -hmm. DEED uh, to DNR to MINDA to PCA. So okay. there's a, a host of agencies typically involved. So for example, if I had a bridge that we funded, it would go through probably MINDOT. Uh, most likely, Madam Chair, yeah. if that's what the legislature, right. how they routed it. Okay. Thanks. So going briefly uh, to the full funding slide, Ms. James gave you a little bit of a preview of this, but this is another state statute, um, 16A502, um, that says no funds can leave the state treasury until MMB has verified that all funding needed to complete the project has been committed to the project. Um, when a bonding bill passes out of the legislature, all of those specific projects need to have appropriations set up in the state's accounting system. Um, for projects where we know full funding needs to be looked at, we place holds on all of those appropriations. Um, so it's another check that no state funds will be released until MMB has had a chance to review and approve the full funding package. MMB has published a capital grants manual that is available on our website um, and another document we'll be happy to share with the committee as well. Um, there, is, there are a couple pages in the capital grants manual that detail the types of documentation that we would be looking for in terms of having funding commitments in place. And just to tie out the policy reason for this is that the state would not want to become a financial investor in a project that can't be completed. Um, so the, fund, the state funds are tied up until all of the funding is in place to help ensure that the project gets built and delivered as intended. One last restriction um, to highlight for you here today about that applies to state bonding projects is the application of the cancellation statute, which is Minnesota Statute 16A.642. Uh, capital projects have roughly a four-year time horizon to commit, get the, have their funds committed uh, to a project. Um, otherwise, they risk losing those funds. That four-year time period does not mean the funds need to be fully spent, uh, just that they need to be committed to the project by the end of that time period. So for state agencies, uh, that typically involves having a signed design contract or signed construction contract. For local projects, that would involve having a signed grant agreement in place by the end of the four years. The cancellation statute does apply to all funding sources that are included in a bonding bill, so it would apply to general obligation bond funded projects, projects funded with cash, and any projects or programs funded with state appropriation bonds. MMB is required to report to the legislature in early January of every year about the list of projects that are slated for cancellation in that year. And we actually just published our 2023 report last week. Um, it shows that the, there's a balance of about $25 million uh, slated for cancellation later this year. About $1 million is uh, a general fund cash for cash funded projects from prior bonding bills and about 24 million um, is in, re in relation to uh, bond and bonding appropriations. And that report is for projects funded in the 2018 bonding bill and earlier. And oh. members, I've seen these cancellations before and what sometimes happens is it gets canceled and sometimes they come to the legislature and ask for an extension. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. So as you just said, the, the balances in that report will cancel July 1st this year, um, unless they're specifically extended by the legislature during the current session. Um, for any balances that do cancel on July 1st, we will use those canceled balances to pay down existing outstanding debt. Um, but if we determine that we have not yet sold bonds for any of those projects, then we will just reduce our future bond sales accordingly. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief question on the cancellation. I think, you know, we've all seen that. That happens particularly like if you're dealing with the federal government. Sometimes that seems to take a bit longer. But I'm just wondering, you know, we've been through some very unusual years uh, with COVID. And I'm just wondering, are you expecting or, or did our, maybe you could just tell me, did we see more cancellations than normal as you put out the report this last year? Because we had a couple very, you know, shutdown years. We just had some, did you see, were there more cancellations or just a curiosity question? Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, the $25 million is a slightly larger balance than we've seen in the past several cancellation reports. Anecdotally, we did hear from a couple projects that the pandemic did slow down their ability to pull together a full funding package. Um, so there could be instances where they are still hoping to move their project forward and just had been not, not been able to yet, but we don't have tons of data on that question exactly. Thank, thank you. I seem to remember it's been more like four or five million dollars typically of cancellations. So, and then we love to respend that money though, rather than let you pay down the debt. So I can pause here for any other questions on bonding restrictions before pivoting and talking about debt capacity and capital investment guidelines. Any questions? Okay, Senator Nelson. I'll be brief, and it might not be here, it might be at the end, but I just want to, you know, one of the things I'm running into is we're seeing a lot of entities, you know, we're seeing a lot of land use changes, the way people uh, work now, we have a lot of empty office buildings, retail is very different now with uh, not as much uh, in-person retail, much more going to e-commerce. And what I've noticed is there's a number of uh, educational entities or uh, museums that are renting a former mall space or they're renting office space. Now normally they would come for bonding and they would bond maybe for a new building. But the reality is we have a glut of empty buildings and I just haven't quite figured out is there a way to somehow do the responsible thing which is rather than having an incentive to build new buildings when we have a uh, uh, this, uh, we have extra s building space. Is there a way to use our capital investment to help those entities that instead of building a building, they're leasing a wing from a mall, for example? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, I think there's a lot that we're all still learning from the last three years and trying to reestablish what the ground underneath our feet all looks like and what it should look like going forward. Um, any type of project that comes forward will still go through the analysis that we've walked through. Um, does it meet the public ownership test? Is it in furtherance of a public purpose? Can it meet the other state statutory requirements? And if projects can continue to check those boxes, then um, it's something that would be eligible for bond funding, but it would still need to meet all of those um, constitutional and tax requirements. Thank you. If it was a standalone building, it seems like they could buy it, but if it was part of a mall. Oh, what I've noticed the most is the malls. The malls are turning into, you know, um, destination sites for things other than retail. And some of these entities would be interested in what would normally be a bonding project, but instead it's a wing of a mall. And the malls are, at least at this point, not uh, willing to like condoize, you know, that wing of the mall because right. maybe I they're think thinking that's maybe what that's happened. The I was just thinking of the Minnesota, Minnesota Museum of Art, which is in an old historic building, but I, I would assume they must have condoized that in order to, to you know, to own that yeah. portion. So it's the ownership, I guess, mm -hmm. that's the bit as opposed right. to leasing that I, I just don't quite have my mind wrapped around how that might work yet. Thank you. 
Okay, can continue. Thank you. So I'll, I'll pivot to um, the uh, capital investment guidelines and debt capacity, but the one slide I did want to show the committee first is what the municipal bond market has been up to recently. Um, this slide here uh, has a four-year look back about what municipal bond rates have been doing. Um, you can see we really did have truly historic lows in 2020 and 2021. Um, and rates continued to climb back up throughout the course of 2022. So that's the far right-hand side of the graph here. Um, the rates also in 2022 um, experienced some periods of volatility um, that had not been experienced exactly in the prior years. Um, and we expect these, these higher rates and some period of volatility to continue into the near future. Um, but I don't want you to take away that rates are all of a sudden at historic highs because you can see looking back a little bit farther um, that rates are really back up more around where they were at the end of 2018. Um, but this is a look at what we're looking at in the municipal bond market um, current day. So Ms. Nolner talked a lot about some of the budget information that you'll be using, and we do, MNB publishes a debt capacity forecast twice a year in conjunction with the budget and economic forecast. It's a good snapshot. It's where you can pull a lot of this information out of in terms of what the state's current debt portfolio looks like, what our debt service costs are, and what our borrowing capacity um, is. Uh, the table here shows, again, that the state currently has j uh, just about $8 billion in outstanding debt with another uh, just over $2 billion of debt that's been already authorized by the legislature and we just haven't sold yet. Mm. So I'll first walk you through uh, the state's capital. Can you back up for a minute guidance. as um, why haven't you sold that? Are the, are the projects not completed? They're not ready to go? So you haven't issued the debt? At what point do you don't issue the debt? Usually, usually you do it in August, right? So you only issue the debt for projects that are totally ready then? Madam Chair, what we typically do is we issue bonds based on the cash flow needs of the projects. Mm -hmm. So when a bonding bill passes out of the legislature, we do not issue all of those bonds all at once. Okay. Um, we will work with the state agencies to understand their cash flow needs over the coming 12-month period. And then we'll size our bond sale and, and sell as many bonds as we think are needed for that 12-month that period. So the authorized but unissued um, column on this table um, shows you those projects just haven't been cash flow ready for the funds yet, but we have no indication that they're um, planning to turn down any of those okay. funds. Thank you. Uh, so turning first to the state's capital investment guidelines, um, just to be clear, these are administrative guidelines, um, executive guidelines put out by the executive branch. But the state has had some form of capital investment guidelines in place going back to 1979. Um, they have been refreshed and reformed over the years. The last time we took a look and refreshed our capital investment guidelines was 2009, um, when we brought them more into compliance or conformity with how the state rating or the, the national rating agencies were rating our debt and which debt they were looking at. Um, and the guidelines now allow for some broader comparability across states so that we can compare this Minnesota's debt pro profile to some of our peer states as well. We, we put these guidelines out there and hope that you will use them too because they really can help guide your decision making when you're, fit, when you're tasked with pulling together a bonding bill um, and trying to determine what's the appropriate size, what's a prudent level of debt um, that the state should be authorizing in any given year. Um, guidelines help communicate um, a commitment to that long-term financial planning um, to have a, a regular capital investment program that the state is looking at. And when we go and meet with the rating agencies every year, um, it is a credit positive for the state's profile that we have these capital investment guidelines and that we manage our debt portfolio to them. Um, it is something that they, they comment on and remark that, that we have well-established guidelines in the state. So before walking through the guidelines um, one at a time, I'll just briefly tell you what type of debt are, are now being captured in the state's capital investment guidelines. And it's everything you see on the slide here. So it's all of our general obligation debt, trunk highway, and our various purpose bonds. Any state appropriation bonds, agency bonds that are payable from standing general fund appropriations, um, like the MHFA housing infrastructure bonds, um, some University of Minnesota debt. 
lease purchase financing for real estate, um, including the certificates of participation sold for this very same building we're in today, um, lease purchase financing for equipment, um, and moral obligation debt. So I'll walk you through each of the guidelines briefly in turn um, so you have a sense of what they're measuring. Guideline number one is a measure of our total tax supported principal that's been sold or what we have outstanding measured against state personal income. Um, in November, uh, the ratio of outstanding debt to personal income was just 2.02%. Um, and the debt that we're measuring under guideline number one is all of our general obligation debt, state appropriation debt, and the, the agency debt that's supported by standing appropriations. The one type of debt that is not picked up in any of our guidelines are the revenue bonds that Ms. James talked about before because that type of debt is supported by its own uh, stream of revenues, its own pledged, pledged security, and not by, by general taxing support of the state. Guideline number two is, is similar to guideline number one um, because it's also looking at total tax supported debt against personal income. But here we, we factor in um, the debt that's been authorized but unissued still. So we're adding in to the debt that we've sold um, the authorized and unissued debt that I showed you on that table um, a couple slides ago. Um, so in November, the ratio of all of our tax-supported debt that's been authorized compared to state personal income was 3.28%. And again, we're measuring all of the debt um, that I mentioned for guideline number one on the previous slide. And we're also factoring in any moral obligation debt issued by the Office of Higher Education and MHFA and any uh, lease purchase financing for equipment, um, including the state's master lease program that we run. Our third and final guideline um, takes a different look at the state's debt portfolio, and it looks just at the state's general obligation debt and how quickly we are scheduled to repay it. Um, under this guideline, we want 40% of our state geo debt to mature within five years, and 70% of the state's geo debt to mature within 10 years. Uh, when we calculate these metrics, we want to be at or above those percentages. So you can see in November, um, we were in compliance with guideline number three with almost 75% of the existing general obligation debt scheduled to mature within 10 years. The policy behind paying off our debt quickly is that we're realizing the cost of bonding bills quickly, and that preserves additional future financial capacity for future legislatures to come and bond for additional projects. This graph here just has a 10 year look back for your information and benefit about how the state has measured under guidelines one and two um, over the last 10 year period. Um, we've been below the threshold set in both of those guidelines over this time horizon. But what do you do with these guidelines when you're thinking about how big a bonding bill should be? And that is where we start talking about debt capacity. Uh, when we measure our guidelines and come do our analysis under in the debt capacity forecast, that's really a point in time uh, comparison about where our debt portfolio stands. Um, and just to reiterate quickly, um, when a bonding bill first passes, that bonding authorization will first appear in our guideline number two calculations. And then once MMB sells the debt, it will also appear in our guideline number one calculations. But how big could the bonding bill be? Um, I think we've already mentioned briefly uh, that the forecast is carrying an assumed cost for future capital budgets, and that is based on a historic rolling average, a 10-year historic rolling average um, from prior capital authorizations. Uh, we have different averages for the even years and the odd years, um, where uh, the Current even year average assumed in the, the current forecast is $880 million capital budget. And in odd years, the forecast is assuming a $135 million future capital budget. Uh, the last November forecast, we did make one adjustment because there was no bonding bill in 2022. And instead of assuming the lower amount in 2023, um, the budget is assuming the larger $880 million um, capital budget in 2023. 
This next table um, bears a little bit of explanation. We published this in the debt capacity forecast. It's an attempt to do some analysis about what the maximum bonding capacity is under the state's capital investment guidelines, primarily only looking at guidelines one and two, uh, measuring the tax supported debt against uh, state personal income. Uh, the takeaways on this report, to draw your attention to them on row two, you can see that the maximum new debt authorization in 2023 um, for the current legislature could be $3.5 billion. Uh, but keep in mind that that is really a combination of all of the types of debt structures that we measure under our guidelines. So all types of general obligation debt, including trunk highway bonds, uh, state appropriation bonds, state supported debt, um, and uh, real estate capital leases. Um, the trade-off, of course, is that is not a budgetary figure, and there is an assumed uh, debt service cost uh, with those larger bonding bills. So the last line on the table here attempts to give you a rough approximation of what the additional debt service cost would be um, for all of those maximum debt authorizations shown in the table. I will just note, because this table is looking across all possible bonding types, um, guideline number three, which is just specific for general obligation bonds, is not reflected in the table. And there, and there would be, um, there is some bearing that um, a certain size of a GO bonding package um, might, um, might bear some additional analysis we, we would need to do under guideline number three to make sure that the state can remain in compliance with all three of our capital investment guidelines. But none of this is put out there um, as a recommendation to the legislature about what an appropriate size of a bonding bill is. It is merely just an attempt to show um, what the state's bonding and borrowing capacity is. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. If it's all right with you, I have a couple of questions sure. for uh, the commissioner. Um, Madam Chair and Commissioner, was wondering if any of the debt guidelines that you presented today are sensitive to changes in interest rate, um, especially as we are currently in a rising interest rate environment. Would that have any impact on these guidelines and how we should think about what the state's debt capacity could be? Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Rasmussen, not exactly. Um, because uh, guidelines one and two are looking at the total principal amount of debt, um, and guideline number three is just measuring how quickly re we repay our debt, um, the sensitivity to interest rate changes is not currently in any of those guidelines. Okay. Madam Chair. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Hasmer. Um, and I would just say that to you know, members on the committee, for us to be aware of that these debt guidelines aren't taking into account rising interest rates, and that's obviously a, a cash cost, especially if we're issuing new debt. And so I think that'll be you know, definitely a part of um, you know, our thinking when we are looking at the debt capacity the state has. And then, um, Madam Chair, I had another uh, follow-up question, that's okay. Continue. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, plans or uh, the process that MMB and what part of this process they might be on, on potentially selling debt instruments to finance repairs of the state office building. And the reason I ask about that, and my uh, second question is, what impact could that potentially have on the numbers we're looking at here in terms of debt capacity? Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Rasmussen, there, I don't have all of the exact uh, data and figures in front of me today that's come to light in recent weeks here about the cost of the state office building, um, but that was legislation that passed um, in 2021, and it does authorize MMB to sell, um, uh, enter into a, a, a real estate lease purchase agreement. It's a similar financing to this uh, Senate building here that would be authorized under that legislation. We've been noting that there is a potential impact on the debt capacity in our debt capacity forecast um, following the enactment of that legislation. We just did not know how much that might be until we had more detailed cost estimates. Um, so really when, um, when we pick up that cost, it, it will impact that $3.5 billion figure. It would be considered part of the analysis about what um, could be done this year under the maximum debt capacity guidelines. Continue. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, um, for that you response. Guys, and I just think it's going to be important for uh, us, Madam Chair, and committee members to be um, keeping an eye on that because that it is a capital project that would be issuing a debt-like instrument that impacts the numbers that we're looking at. And so I don't know, perhaps, if in the February forecast we'll have some more clarity on 
on that or how we should be thinking about that as we look at a potential bonding bill. Um, and then Madam Chair just had one other follow-up question. If that's Senator okay. Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering, um, Commissioner, if you could uh, give us a little color in terms of the feedback that you've been getting from rating agencies and um, if, if there's you know, any concerns in a potential uh, you know, change in our outlook or any feedback that they give you as you go to those meetings. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rasmussen, it's, we should be tooting our own horns, everyone in this room, because the state is happy to report that we now have AAA ratings from all three rating agencies, um, an accomplishment that we were very happy to celebrate and achieve this last summer um, when Moody's was the last remaining rating agency that upgraded the state to that AAA rating level. Um, so AAA is the highest rating uh, for those of you that um, are unfamiliar with the rating process. So it was something that we've been going to them for many, many years now and trying to argue for taking a very fresh look at the state. Um, and we're happy to have crossed that threshold this year, so there are no concerns about the outlook for the state, um, and everything is very stable and very high credit quality. Senator Dibble. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I would just mention um, a little bit about the Trunk Highway uh, Fund and Trunk Highway bonds and our capacity there discrete to that subject. Um, we have a a state guideline, I'm not sure if it's in the law, I always forget if it's just a guideline or if it's the law. But in any case, um, uh, we are limited to only uh, taking on um, with both newly issued debt as well as uh, you know financing that we're obligated to pay 20% of state sources in the Trunk Highway Fund. And at the current rate of both debt financing as well as anticipated uh, obligations. Um, we're at about, eight, we're, right, we're bumping up right against that ceiling. We're at about 18 point something percent of the capacity of the Trunk Highway Fund to support bonding, which would leave us only about 200 and some million dollars in Trunk Highway Fund capacity uh, at present. So it's uh, very, very little. We've been bonding ourselves to the hilt in the Trunk Highway Fund for quite some time. All of these quote unquote historic levels of funding for transportation um, that have been touted in recent years, that's actually borrowed money. That's money that uh, is debt in the Trunk Highway Fund. So that's where we're at on that matter. Wow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Interesting news. <clears throat> So my last slide before turning it back to you, Madam Chair, is just to situate the Minnesota's debt portfolio and profile um, within the context of all 50 states. Um, so this graph just shows you um, using Moody's reported data about the state's debt uh, obligations compared to personal income that Minnesota really does mm -hmm. fall right in the middle of the pack with a very moderate debt burden. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any other questions or just turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Um, Senator Nelson, then Senator Dibble. Just, just a brief question. You know, I recall, uh, I believe there was a guideline, which I didn't see in here, but I think it maybe has been replaced several years ago. Uh, did we not have a guideline, I, I think Senator Pappas would probably know this, where we had uh, like 3% of our general fund budget was eligible for, uh, for bond uh, payments. Is that, uh, Commissioner, can you just, shed some light on that. And I see we have different guidelines. I think they've been this way now for maybe a decade, but how does that impact, like with that old guideline, what would our, what would our debt uh, capacity be? Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, there did used to be a guideline. It was well before my time at the state here. Um, so I was not involved in uh, moving away from that. Um, and the guidelines really did change and evolve over the many decades that they've been in place. Um, some have been added, some have been removed. That was one that was removed in 2009. Um, and the current guidelines, they're really structured to allow for this better comparability. Um, that debt service guideline, if I remember correctly, was only focused on general obligation debt yeah. and was not all encompassing of all the different types of financing mechanisms that are now here, um, now, in, now in use in the state. Um, if you think back to that pie chart that Ms. Noldner, I believe, showed you before, debt service is about 2% of the overall state budget right now. Senator Dibble. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was happy to hear about the uh, AAA ratings that we have from the, all three rating agencies. Um, I do one. I have wondered, though. I mean, I've, I've been told in the past, and I might have even, you know, woven it into speeches of mine about how our failure to address uh, uh, aging infrastructure sometimes mitigates against how the bond rating agencies view us because that represents kind of a future liability and if we let the roads get you know too decrepit um, at some point we have to pay the piper and that's potential pressure and liability on the state budget and we're just not keeping up with our capital assets in the way that we should um, is that true and um, and have the bond rating agencies ever taken notice about uh, of how um, our much vaunted you know we have tremendous amount of highway miles in the state of Minnesota, the fifth largest number of highway miles in the entire country, not per capita, fifth largest highway uh, roadway system in the country. Um, but it's, you know, 50 years old. Um, is, that a, is that a thing? Deputy Commissioner. Yep. Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, um, that is exactly something that the rating agencies have been publishing commentary on. I have not seen any specific comments as it pertains exactly to Minnesota. One of the challenging factors there is having the right data to measure exactly what is the current status of all of our infrastructure. I think it's widely known and reported that there are critical needs that need to be addressed and that uh, many states beyond Minnesota are falling behind and not keeping up. Um, so it is something that the rating agencies have been looking at, are concerned about for states moving forward, uh, but nothing specific about Minnesota at this point. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner, and thank you all members for hanging in here through some pretty heavy stuff. We have one more short presentation. Um, on the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund. And um, if we could ask, it uh, looks like um, Marianne Comboy is doing that. Do you have some helpers, Bree Mackey and Shannon Morse? Um, feel free to come forward and uh, we'll run through this quickly. Maybe we'll even be done a little bit early. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my colleagues at the Department of Employment and Economic Development and the Department of Education and I will be providing background about the Capital Projects Fund. The Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund was established in the Federal American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 to provide payments to states, territories, freely associated states, and tribal governments, quote, to carry out critical capital projects directly enabling work, education, and health monitoring, including remote options, in response to the public health emergency with respect to the coronavirus disease COVID-19, end quote, according to its statutory language. The U.S. Department of the Treasury released guidance in September 2021, which included information about the process to receive funds, including project eligibility. The Capital Projects Fund is not a competitive grant program. Each state has its own allocation. Minnesota's allocation is $180.7 million. Funds must be expended by December 31st, 2026. For capital projects to be an eligible use of the Capital Projects Fund, it must meet all of the following criteria. First, the capital project invests in capital assets directly they're directly designed to enable work, education, and health monitoring. And what does this mean? According to Treasury, a project can be a new construction, purchase, or installation of a capital asset, or improvements and repairs to a capital asset. And recipients must show that projects are designed to jointly enable work, education, and health monitoring. However, those activities need not be the exclusive function of the project. This slide provides background for what guidance was provided to the states by Treasury at the time when states were deciding on how to use the funds. According to Treasury's guidance, broadband infrastructure projects that construct and deploy broadband infrastructure, digital connectivity technology projects for devices and equipment that facilitate broadband internet use, and multi-purpose community facility projects to construct or improve buildings that are designed to jointly enable work education and health monitoring are presumptively eligible for the fund. Notably, general infrastructure projects such as highways and bridges 
are ineligible for the fund, and there was also an option for a case-by-case -case review. The final plans for how each state would use its allocation were required to be submitted to Treasury by September 24, 2022. Minnesota met that deadline and has submitted its final plans for its $180.7 million allocation. In Minnesota's plan, two of the three presumptively eligible programs on the previous slide were selected. Broadband infrastructure projects made up 72% of the total allocation with $130.7 million. Those amounts were appropriated by the legislature in the 2021 first special session and the 2022 legislative session. And details about the specific broadband programs and how those funds will be used will be provided in a moment by deed. Multi-purpose community facility projects made up 28% of the total allocation with $50 million. This amount was submitted to Treasury after the 2022 legislative session ended with $50 million unappropriated. This part of the plan utilized Legislative Advisory Commission or LAC authority. And MDE will be providing details about that in a moment. Um, this table is another way of seeing how the state's $180.7 million allocation is set to be spent. And each program was, um, and Treasury assesses, approves, and releases the funds for each program separately. And so the broadband programs have all received the Treasury approval to be spent, but Minnesota awaits the Treasury approval or feedback for the Multipurpose Community Facility Projects Program. And I'll turn it over to Bree Mackey, the Broadband Director at the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senators. My name for the record is Bree Mackey, and I am the Executive Director of the Office of Broadband Development. There are three programs that I'm going to highlight today in the broadband um, part of our, our capital projects funds, which total $130.7 million. The first is our Office of Broadband Grant Program that we're all very familiar with, most likely, the Border Border Grant Program. This is Minnesota's existing grant program and designed really to catalyst uh, and to draw other investments into areas that most need um, that otherwise may not to get com uh, commercially attracted uh, partners, private partners in investment alone. So this really helps make the business case to new and existing providers to invest in building broadband infrastructures to unserved and underserved areas of the state. As many of you also know that this started in 2014 and we are currently in our eighth round of grant funding, noting that in December we did our largest grant awards at over $99 million in funding 61 projects in 41 counties across the state of Minnesota. And we also estimate that this will reach over 33 million homes and businesses. As a reminder, this particular program is 50% cost share and has a maximum grant limit of $5 million. The next program I'm going to talk about is the Broadband Line Extension Program, which has $15 million in it. This is a new program to address the need of homes and businesses that may have broadband available at the road but unable to afford the access to their doors. One story as an example I'd like to share because during the pandemic, it was definitely exacerbated. In May of 2020, the Office of Broadband Development received an inquiry from a resident that had two adults working from home and two students doing distance learning. There was broadband at the end of their driveway. However, the quote to get to their actual door was $2,000, and this was just not financially feasible for their family. I'm happy to report that the portal for this application period is open, and as of December 31st, 2022, we had 545 applicants for this program. The last program I would like to highlight is the Broadband Lower Population Density Pilot Program, which $30 million is in this. This, again, is a new program within our Border to Border Grant Program. It addresses the feedback from providers and communities that the program's cap of 50, 
50% for eligible costs up to $5 million per project was just not adequate to support projects in the harder served areas of the state. The pilot program enables us to make awards of 75% of eligible costs and there is a cap of $10 million per project. Applicants will have additional narrative questions and will need to identify how many passes per mile in their application. Additional points in this process will be given based on those responses. We do expect a high demand and applications for this program. With that, I'm happy to turn it over for questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Shana Morris, Assistant Director of Government Relations at the Department of Education, and I'm here to talk about the Multipurpose Community Facility Projects uh, Program. MDE submitted in partnership with the Children's Cabinet a $50 million proposal focused on these multipurpose community facility projects in September of 2022 to Treasury. As you heard, the multipurpose community facility projects is one option for these funds, and uh, all of those projects must support both ed or all three things, education, work, and health monitoring. The funds have to be used for cap capital projects, obviously, and they must be uh, used by December 31st of 2026. As you heard, at this point, that has not been approved, and we have not heard back from Treasury. We do anticipate receiving feedback, and we do expect there to be some substantial back and forth uh, answering questions and providing clarity and kind of working towards uh, finalizing some of the program details. We do anticipate that it could take up to a year for this process to unfold. And so if that were to be the case, we would expect a fall 2023 approval, rolling out then in March of 2024. Given the lack of approval from Treasury, we don't have full details to share, like you heard from Ms. Maki on the other, on the other uh, programs, but we do have an idea of kind of what we expect to unfold uh, once we do have that approval. At that time, we would create a framework for grant administration and scoring. We would anticipate that all of the administration application scoring and processing uh, would occur for Greater Minnesota applications through the Minnesota Initiative Foundations, or MIFs, and in the uh, seven county metro area that it would occur through the Greater Twin Cities United Way, given their leadership and connections in this space. It would likely be a competitive process, funding projects that invest in areas that will address challenges exasperated by the pandemic, that support cross-sector strategies to advance economic stability, well-being, and educational opportunities, and that also can leverage uh, and align existing um, investments and, and uh, strategies in place. Guidance from Treasury did specifically call out a few examples that we might be familiar with here in Minnesota. Full service community schools are deemed eligible, community health centers, and also libraries. In Minnesota, other things we might think about include family resource centers, community-based organizations, community centers, and community colleges. Uh, and then the final note I would just say here, it's common for points for eligibility for something like this to have criteria that's looked at um, service to historically and persistently uh, disinvested communities. Uh, applications that have a commitment to collaborative leadership and community partnerships, looking at a demonstrated need or demand for the facility in a community, and uh, making sure that it's, they have a solid mission, vision, and um, access to the community, and then feasibility and cost justification, of course. And so thank you for the opportunity to provide an update. We're really excited about these funds and the opportunities that could, could provide communities with the flexibility. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question on the multi-purpose community facility projects, and um, was wondering if you could talk about why it's taking longer to receive Treasury approval for that in particular, given the timelines that we've seen for the broadband dollars, and is there any risk that Treasury would not approve those funds as laid out here? Um, Ms. Morse. Madam Chair, Senator Rasmussen. We have heard that this has just been kind of the average from other states. I think that it's about a year. I think Treasury is probably very well aware of the deadlines uh, of 2026. Um, and so at this point, I'm not privy to any information that would, you know, it, um, indicate why the timeline is what it is. But I would expect that we would be hearing back any time now um, because they're aware of the timelines as well and the timeline that these projects take. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Morris, my question also is on the multipurpose community facility projects. And uh, the question I, I have is, um, 
Is it possible to either see what was introduced or what was uh, given to the federal government that we're waiting to get uh, information on? It was clear how the grants would be appropriated through MIF or through, uh, I forgot what the other entity was, MIF's the one I know. Um, I guess my question is though, are there limitations upon those possible grant projects based upon what we submitted to the feds? That's my question. And you can get back with me on that or show me the application. I just want to get a sense of what we are looking at in Minnesota for that. Ms. Morse. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, um, I think that we were trying to take a broad approach in Minnesota so that there's flexibility within communities and I believe, I don't know that we, I don't have any reason to think that we can't share that so I can certainly check back and see if we can get you the full Thank you very much. Any other questions? Well, I think we've come, thank you very much, the three of you, I appreciate that information. Uh, thank you everyone who testified today. Um, I want to ask now uh, Ms. Carlson if she could just tell us what we're going to be doing on Thursday. Hi there. All right, so on Thursday we'll be meeting to hear from NCSL. We'll receive an update on IIJA on core infrastructure areas and then new guidance from federal government. Um, I would also like to just plug that we have a joint committee meeting on Friday morning. Um, would you like to go into that? Yes, thank you for reminding me. So members, um, because the bonding committee really hasn't had regular meetings, uh, very many regular meetings in the Senate for years, um, we're kind of trying to fast track everything and bring everyone up to speed. So. On the, um, I apologize for taking up more of your time, but it's really important that we learn about these different issues. So on the next three Friday mornings, we're going to be having joint um, roundtable discussions and tours in, um, in the community. We don't have to travel very far. So this week is housing. With the housing committee, we'll be going over to um, higher ground, which is right downtown St. Paul. Um, we'll be driving on our own and we'll give you instructions as to where to go and where to park. Um, and having a roundtable discussion after we do a short tour of the facility with housing advocates. Then the following Friday, the theme is food insecurity and we'll be meeting with the Ag Committee at uh, Merritt Community Center in St. Paul and hearing from a number of the food shelves of what some of their infrastructure needs are and the Ag Commissioner will be there with us as well to kind of talk about some food to market issues. Then on the third Friday, we'll, um, we have a van from the University of Minnesota that will pick us up here at the Capitol at 9.30 and we're gonna go visit the chemistry lab. It's a major request from the U of M, I think something like $90 million. And this chemistry lab is like from something out of the 1920s. It's an embarrassment and I really want everyone to see it, to see how important it is that our, um, our uh, research institution, uh, the state of Minnesota, that wants to have world-class education for chemistry students. I mean, high schools have far superior labs than this lab. And I don't know if you saw it last year on the bonding tour. I think Senator Jasinski would have seen it last year on the bonding tour, the University of Minnesota Chemistry Building. So that's what will be going on the final, um, the final Friday. So I would absolutely love to have you all join us. And Ms. Carlson will be providing more information um, as to the details. Thank you all. Any last minute questions or concerns? Then the meeting stands adjourned seven minutes early. <laughs>